Hi, uh, my name is Neil Lawson and I'm the chair of Compass and welcome to the Compass annual lecture. Um, just a few announcements uh, before we begin, begin proper. Uh, firstly, obviously, switch off your mobiles, but switch on your brain for what I think will be a fantastic evening. Um, second, if anyone happens to have 250 quid, £2.50, whatever, and wants to meet me for dinner to influence the future <laughs> policy agenda of Compass, I'm around any night this week and any week. Um, thirdly, um, this is the last big event that Compass will have while Gavin Hayes is our General Secretary, and I would just like to thank Gavin for all of his work over the eight years of Compass um, and wish him well for whatever he does next. So if we could just thank Gavin for the stuff he's done for Compass. And if you want a job like his, then you've got until Thursday to apply for it. Um, I'll introduce our panel um, in turn when they speak and respond uh, to Richard. Uh, I'll introduce them properly, but just so that you know, we've got Deborah Orr from The Guardian. We've got Ed Mayo from the Cooperative Movement. We've got Hannah Worth from the Chamberlain Forum in uh, Birmingham. And we've got Lisa Nandy, who's the Labour MP for Wigan. Um, so on to the main event. Um, Richard Sennett is the Centennial Professor of Sociology at the London School of Economics and is University Professor of Humanities at the New York University. He's written loads and loads of great books, um, uh, most of which I've read and thoroughly enjoyed. The highlights for me are The Fall of Public Man, The Culture of New Capitalism, The Craftsman, and in particular my favourite is The Corrosion of Character up until now when we celebrate the publication of this together the rituals, pleasures, and politics of cooperation. Richard doesn't just write books. He makes things happen in the public realm. Uh, he uh, spent a decade at the New York Institute of Humanities in, in New York, uh, running projects there. He's worked in the, and chaired the United Nations Commission on Urban Development. He's been president of the American Council on Work uh, looking at research projects into the changing patterns of American labor. He's helped create and chaired the Cities Program at the London School of Economics, and he served as the chair of the jury of the Venice Biennial. I happen to know as well that Richard is a very good cello player to a very high standard. I know as well that he happens to love opera. Um, and I know that on occasions he has an incredible ability to have an impact on the political agenda. Just two very quick highlights from me. Um, he wrote a book once called Respect in a, in a World of Inequality, which somehow Tony Blair and New Labour seemed to get completely wrong. They decided that the respect had to go from the poor to the rich. And what Richard meant, and if they'd have bothered to read the book, they would have found out that what he meant that respect has to go down from the powerful and the rich to the not so powerful and the rich. Um, and I enjoyed his responses in The Guardian to that misinterpretation of that work. I also liked a particularly fine article in The Guardian where he wrote about the politics of dependency and that kind of railing against dependency culture. Uh, and Richard said, look, we depend on each other. You know, we can't not depend on each other. We have to. The world would be intolerable if we didn't depend on each other. And in both those instances, he's absolutely right. I think Richard helps us to understand what the world does to us and, crucially, what we might do together to make it a better place. It seems to me that Richard Sennett is living a good life, and it seems to me that he's helping us to understand what we might do to make a good society. Uh, Richard, we have your respect, and we are dependent on you. And I'm absolutely delighted to ask you to give the third Compass annual lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess the way we're going to organize this evening is I'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes. And we'll have some chit chat here, and then we'll have uh, talks. OK, that's fine. Um, this is uh, 
this is actually a better title for the book than uh, the title I chose. Uh, because what uh, I'm interested in this book in is uh, the craft of cooperation, uh, the learning how to cooperate well with others, particularly with uh, others whom you don't know, uh, you don't understand, or even you don't like. And uh, to co that kind of demanding cooperation uh, requires um, skill. And I'd like to focus tonight on uh, uh, some of the skills required for complex cooperation with people who aren't uh, intimates or familiars to you. Um, I'd like to preface this because this is a poli uh, uh, has got a political shadow uh, to it in the past. Um, if we were uh, in Paris 112 years ago, we could have gone to something that was called a musée social, a social museum, which was a very bad name for an exhibit on the edge of the universal um, exposition in Paris, 1900, which was a gathering of the left. And um, there were just, it was um, an unofficial uh, 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 gathering at this Musée Social. And it was a kind of slugfest between what was emerging as the political left and what had already emerged as uh, the social left. On the side of the political left were calls for solidarity, for unity of purpose, uh, for coalition making, uh, organized top down. It was the beginning of really huge political uh, parties on the left in both Germany and France and the United States. On the social left, uh, there were people who were much more diverse. Uh, people who had run cooperatives, settlement houses, um, uh, communitarians of various sort. And their emphasis, rather than on solidarity, was on cooperation. And that division, it seems to me, has remained for most of this century. Uh, the political left is very orientated to policy. It looks at social relations on the ground as a means to an end of creating larger national uh, forms of, of unity. Uh, the social left takes human connection more as um, an end in itself. Uh, and if it leads to practical political action, great. If that action doesn't accumulate up to a national level, so be it. The idea is face-to-face, -face, local uh, 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 effort together rather than something that's very goal-orientated. I don't need to tell any of you that the political left is pretty much dominated. This emphasis on solidarity and on unity it became the dominant modus vivendi of the left through most of the last century. And the social left was rather neglected. My own view is today that we have to at least redress this balance, um, that the social left, for various reasons, offers us an opportunity to do things that we can't do within, I'm sorry to say, the framework of national political parties. Uh, uh, it offers us an opportunity to take advantage of technologies that didn't exist a century ago and that connect people much more directly than they were ever connected before. But it also, I think, is a way of renewing the notion of what it means to be on the left, to give the idea of being committed to other people a kind of purpose which is exhausted in political terms. 
Um, I, I, I've been very much involved in the Occupy uh, movement in the States, uh, unfortunately not here. So, uh, but what I learned from what happened in the Occupy movement was that its ideology was a kind of no-brainer for anybody, and not really of that much interest. I and mean, we're against capitalism, so what's new? Uh, everybody believes that. Uh, but the real locus of the Occupy movement, at least in, in the States, was that lots of people who didn't know each other were getting together in rather unpredictable ways and self-organizing. And my hope is that we're going to see more of that. I don't know what will happen to the Occupy movement. We're in a bad way at the moment for reasons I can explain to you later, at least in the States. Uh, but things like that, I think, are going to be the kinds of forms of social action that engage people. Um, it was very moving to me uh, that the usual types didn't turn up at the Occupy movement. Of course, there were people there who were skilled you know, community organizers and had all the patter and so on. There were lots of pensioners as well. There were people who had never been to, to a demo, just hanging out. There were lots of middle-aged, unemployed people, the kinds of people that organized politics doesn't usually reach. So that's a background. I have to warn you, I'm very long-winded. All professors are long-winded, and I'm particularly long-winded. But that's kind of the background for thinking about if cooperation is in our future, how do we get good at uh, doing it? How is it something that um, we uh, can practice well? Um, to get into this subject, you have to get out of your minds the notion that cooperation is something that's an act of uh, morality or ethics. Uh, from the moment all of us were born, we were having to find ways to cooperate with the people who, who fed us, and with the people who uh, educated us. We had to find ways of cooperating with other, other infants and children and so on. And um, it's, we don't know where in the brain cooperation is located, but it is certainly something that is built into us biologically, otherwise we wouldn't survive. Uh, often when people talk about cooperation, they equate it with being good to other people. And in fact, it's much more complex than that. It's finding a way in the world uh, when you need other people to do what you can't do for yourself, which is basically what cooperation is, is about. I should say about this that in developmental terms and psychological terms, we know two things about how cooperation evolves among children. Around the ages of four or five, Children have to manage the relationship between cooperating with others, whether adults or peers, and their own feelings of autonomy. That is, for the first time, that they, because they have enough sense of self, that the notion of cooperation seems to be a kind of zero-sum game with people, with their sense of their own selfhood. And young human beings learn how to adjust that. Uh, just a little later in developmental terms, people need to begin to deal with the relationship between cooperation and competition. And these are, you know, these are developmental stages. They don't have precise years to them. But our, what we see in, the, in nurseries in the beginning years of school is that what young human beings have to do is not simply learn how to play nicely in the sand, sandbox with each other. But at the point at which they're able to play games and organize themselves into games, they learn that cooperation is not simply a kind of us against them, but that they have to have ground rules with the people they're competing against in order to play games. In other words, that the sense of fairness in a game 
not cheating, is something that is a way of working out the relationship between cooperating and competing. And that has this developmental uh, structure to it, which kids become good at, or can become good at, around the ages of five or six, six to seven, a little more than that. Um, uh, agreeing the rules of a game is a form of cooperation. And so that's, these are sort of basic developmental stages. They never get resolved, but they're worked through again and again. Now, what I want to talk to you about tonight are three skills that adults need to develop in order to cooperate with people who they don't know, whom they don't understand, or whom they dislike. And uh, in good professor fashion, I've got very fancy names for the three of them. The first is dialogic skill. The second is what's called skills of subjunctive expression. And the third are empathic skills. And I try and the book, this wonderfully inexpensive book, <laughs> explains all of this in great detail. But I try and condense this for you. Uh, First about dialogics, this is what we really mean when we talk about listening skills. Um, the word dialogics comes from the um, a Russian um, um, language analyst, Mikhail Bakhtin. And it means li listening for the intention behind someone else's words. Not to what people say, but what they mean. And Bakhtin was interested in, in this because he thought that in everyday life, you know, we're struggling. We, we don't have, unlike politicians, not you, I'm sure, but unlike most politicians, the ready patter is not really a reflection of what we want to say to other people. It takes time. It's often confused and so on. And for Bakhtin, the notion of dialogism was just listening for those hints, particular hints in language of other people that gave a kind of unlocked what was behind this surface sheen, glistening sheen of words or all the cracks in it. The other thing about dialogics is that it's a process. Um, Unlike a kind of dialectical argument where there's a thesis and antithesis and then a synthesis, in other words, where you arrive and you agree on a conclusion. And dialogics, it's a process where you may not come to a conclusion, a resolution, bullet points that you can, that you can uh, name as what our conversation meant. Oftentimes, because you're listening to the meaning behind words, rather than the words themselves, you come away with quite a fractured sense of, of the common ground you share. And to him, this was real life. And learning how to interact with other people so that you were attentive to these, what he called the, the, this hidden, behind the veil of language, the, the, the <coughs> hidden meaning of another person's speech, and they to you in the same way. And leaving the process open was, he thought, a, a peculiar kind of cooperative act that suited people who were strangers to each other, who couldn't take things for granted in common. So that's dialogical skill. And as I say in this wonderfully inexpensive book, I try and lay out how people actually develop it in different kinds of institutional settings. Um, can I just skitter? Oh, away from this. I once followed Blair. You know, Blair was a kind of black cloud over my life when I came to Britain. I just couldn't bear it. You know, my book was so clear. Anyhow, so I decided to follow this black cloud when he went on one of these famous listening expeditions to people. You remember those? Yeah. You know, making contact with the public and I sort of snuck myself and I didn't wear a false mustache, but I was, I was tempted. And his version of listening to people was someone would ask him a question and he'd give them an answer. He never said, what do you mean? He never said, that's interesting, or 
tell me more. That's not a listening skill. And oftentimes, you know, we do this on the left, you know, the notion of getting in touch with the people means explaining yourself to them rather than listening. I'm sorry about that. It's just, it's, as I say, it's a black cloud that's hung over my life forever. Uh, the second aspect of developing the craft of cooperation lies in how you speak to each other. And here there's a difference between declarative and subjunctive speech. And you as Brits are much better at practicing this kind of cooperation than we Americans are. Declarative speech is, I believe, X, Y, and Z. And I want to make it perfectly clear to you what I believe. So there's no mistake. So that everything I say is, is immediately understandable by you. Um, subjunctive speech is, I would have thought, perhaps, something I quite admire about Brits. Now, you may, by using the subjunctive, actually do, this is what academics do, uh, you're such an interesting lecture that you've given us, but perhaps I would have thought, and then the, you know, you, you get the knife is shoved in. But no matter, what subjunctive speech does is um, it allows a space of ambiguity which allows for interaction. Whereas what declarative speech does is present somebody with a, more of a kind of take it or leave it kind of thing. This is what I intend to say to you. Uh, there's quite a deep philosophical issue here, which um, the philosopher Bernard Williams named as the fetish of assertion. That is, when I want to be absolutely clear to you about something, what I'm doing is simplifying everything in myself in order to make a clear statement. I'm avoiding ambiguity for the sake of clarity. But socially, I'm also foreclosing the capacity of having a discussion where we explore things that are ambiguous. And when people learn to really take perhaps seriously, uh, they open up in this ambiguous space, a kind of, uh, in, in this ambiguity, a space for real exchange. They can cooperate in exploring something rather than presenting clarity to clarity. Um, when somebody says to me, I, I'm, I'm going to absolutely try and be as precise as I possibly possibly can about something, even though that's well meant, what I hear in that is a kind of foreclosure of interaction. And that's a skill to learn how to open up those kinds of spaces of ambiguity. The third skill that I think complex cooperation requires has to do with the distinction between empathy and sympathy. You know from reading Adam, and I'm sure it's absolutely you immediately summoning this reference to mind, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, I know it's immediately popped up to all of you, that Smith <coughs> asks himself, why am I willing to help somebody out? When I see uh, somebody fall down on the street, why do I reach out to him or, or to her? And his answer is, I feel sympathy. I identify with them. I imagine that I, too, am feeling that pain. And for Smith, this capacity to identify with other people was, for him, the kind of moral foundation of, of cooperation there but for the grace of God, for whom Richard Dawkins go I, you know, that you, you put yourself in another's place. Empathy is quite a different kind of act of reaching out. It's cooler, whereas sympathy is hot. Empathy is sort of curiosity about what the other person is going through. Um, 
Where does it hurt? Uh, why did they fall? Something like that. It's a cooler emotion that draws on curiosity rather than uh, identification. And what I've argued in, in, in my book is that in the kinds of complex cooperation that we need to deal with in modern society, cooperation where we're dealing with people unlike ourselves, that uh, empathy serves us better than trying to identify with them. It serves us better because we don't presume that we understand what they're going through, which is what sympathy does. Whatever you feel, I can feel. Um, it's a kind of error that I've seen in, I don't know how it's been for you, but I've seen in doing community organizing. When you get bourgeois white community workers going into a poor black ghetto, and people will start complaining, and uh, they, the community organizers do the, their, a version of Clinton's famous phrase, I feel your pain, which is very insulting to people in a community. How can you possibly do that? Harvard student, LSE student, what do you know about what I've lived? Uh, there's a kind of condescension in it. Nothing that you've experienced is foreign to me. Whereas learning how to practice empathy, how to express yourself in a way saying, hmm, how to work, huh? Let, tell me more about it. Uh, and to do that in a way where the other person thinks you're really be interested, because you are interested, you're curious, in a way is much more respectful of the differences between you and, and them. Uh, in the book, I, I, I did a study of a lot of unemployed people in 2008, 2010, and my modal master of empathy is somebody named, what did I call her in the book? Mrs. Schwartz. Well, it's not her name, but it's a close name. Who is a, a, a uh, yeah, James Schwartz, who is a master of empathy. She tells, people tell her how they're suffering and she tells jokes. They complain to her and she changes the subject. But she's listening all the time and she's gradually trying to understand why they're having such a difficult time when they go in job interviews, why they come out of it feeling that they failed rather than the job was impossible and so on. She's very skilled at empathy. And it is a skill in that sense. So these are three ways of developing the craft of cooperation through dialogics, through subjunctive expression, and through the deployment of empathy rather than sympathy. Um, now there are many institutional contexts where it's difficult to deploy these skills. Uh, if you're sitting in front of a computer as a student and you're responding to stuff on the screen and you're divorced from the person next to you, you're not going to learn very much that way about cooperating with them. The chances for dialogic discussion are going to be low. If you're in um, a factory or in a business, uh, where your boss simply wants you to put in your hours, do your job, doesn't care what you think about the job, the development of cooperation with him or her, let's say him, is going to be low, but it can stimulate, and I try and show some instances of that, ways in which you become, you feel more fraternity with other, other people. So the, in, the context makes a lot of uh, difference about whether these skills are gonna develop or not. And come back to where I started, the reason I'm so interested in community work in cities, but community work which is not just local, but tries to organize people uh, where, where they send their kids to, to school, where they work and so on, is that it seems to me a context which that community organizing offers a context for developing these skills, both on the organizer's part 
and on the part of the people who are being organized. In a community, if you're pra practicing empathic skills with, uh, as in my unemployment center, uh, with people who are unemployed, they gradually learn how to be empathic themselves or they'll teach you how to be empathic. So it's why I insist that this, these, the craft of cooperation starts at the bottom, not at the top. Um, I talked about this at an unnamed think tank in London, where the first question is, well, what policies do you think we should put in place to encourage cooperation? And I thought, right we're back to exactly where the left got itself into trouble uh, a century ago. That this is something which, to learn these skills, is something that requires a relatively informal, unstructured, open uh, terrain. And that's what I think community organizing is about. Let me just conclude by saying that I'm much more hopeful that cooperative, uh, that the cooperative impulse is gonna flourish in Britain, certainly than in the US. You have a long and rich history of cooperatives in this country. You had, because for so long you were abused by government, developed all sorts of intermediate institutions which helped you resist um, uh, you know, savings and loans associations, workmen benefits uh, uh, associations, settlement houses, which are a glory of, of 19th and early 20th century working class culture. It's in you, you know, it's part of the legacy of, of social action on the left here. And to me, I think you're probably in a really, you and probably ironically, the Italians, who also have that rich, rich legacy, are really uniquely historically and culturally endowed to give more life to the social left through reviving cooperative institutions and giving cooperation itself a larger role in people's everyday lives. So that's what I wanted to say to you. Thank you very much.